Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Blake Anthony Johnson, who serves as CEO of Chicago Sinfonietta. Blake Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you know, so it's so great to have you on the show. And I would be remiss if I did not also add that you happen to be a Sphinx leader uh, as well. So Sphinx is very, very proud to be able to have that uh, association and, and to be able to support your extraordinary trajectory, um, which we want to talk about. But I figure let's dive right in. There may be some members of our audience who aren't familiar with Chicago Sinfonietta. And, uh, and my sense is it really kind of stands out uniquely amongst the tapestry of American orchestras. So just wondering if you could give us kind of the quick 101 about Sinfonietta. Absolutely. Our, our mission statement is championing equity, diversity, and inclusion by creating community through both symphonic experiences. We started in 1987 by maestro Paul Freeman, and he really wanted to create an orchestra that really addressed the lack of diversity on stage, but also the lack of mirroring um, of the city um, in which many orchestras reside in. And so the orchestra has for a long time been a huge champion of really, you know, championing representation. Uh, both on stage, but also in staff and on the board, ancillary groups. Um, and of course, people know the organization quite a bit because of the recordings that we um, tend to, to produce to make sure that, you know, we diversify the field just a little bit more each year. Yeah, well, of course, right, it's truly amazing. And that legacy of capturing so many works by composers of color, um, is just truly an amazing and extraordinary legacy for the orchestra. And congratulations to you. I think you either are right or certainly one of the youngest CEOs of a nationally recognized orchestra uh, in terms of your appointment. So major kudos there. Thanks. <laughs> um, and so in that, I'm, I'm curious when you come in to write a big part of what we want to do on the show is kind of pull away that the veil of mystery that a lot of people have as they think about, should I be in a CEO role, all of that. So I'm curious kind of coming in and taking the reins of an existing institution, um, and especially being a younger leader coming in, right? Sometimes uh, people will feel as younger leaders that, um, you know, it's harder to to garner the, you know, the follow through or, or frankly, even the respect, right, of people who I've been around here for 20 years, I know better than, you know, someone just coming in kind of thing. Um, but just wondering in terms of leadership style um, and approach, how did you bring and what skill sets do you feel were really important that you brought and have brought to this role that you've now been in for about a year? Absolutely, that's a great question. I really, it's funny that you use the word experience because I, of course, come from a performance background and something that was really instilled in me was experience and talent. It's really just a multiplier of work ethic and integrity. And so you can have so much experience in bad practices or antiquated practices. Um, you can have so much talent, but not actually use it to kind of advance, you know, your craftsmanship. And so what I have really kind of focused on since I am, I don't have, you know, this 30 year tenure uh, under my belt is really focused on the work that kind of lies ahead um, to forward the institution to, you know, to really advance it in the way that I think orchestra should. And so I think someone who's really interested in being a CEO, you should, you know, have a really clear idea of what your dream organization looks like. Um, because no matter kind of what you do, um, you're going to get really thoughtful responses and feedback um, that maybe push you one way or the other. And if you don't have that really clear idea of what you're doing and why you're doing it, it can make it a little more difficult. So I think what I really have been focusing on is, you know, where does Chicago Symphony to fit here locally and regionally in Chicago? And what's that role, you know, really articulating it and really making sure that elevator pitch 
It's not just in my back pocket, but in the back pocket of every single CS family member, but then also really articulating our role nationally and internationally. You know, there's so many orchestras that of course are kind of um, exploring this EDI space and our organization has done it for quite a bit of time. And so I think kind of articulating, okay, what does you know EDI be look like once you have 32 years of legacy behind you? Kind of really kind of articulating that has been you know my my north star, I guess you can say, since I've been here. Well, that you know really gets to a good point, and I love how you raise that. Right? For it seems like you know in the past year, so many orchestras are like, ah, EDIB, DEI, we should be really about diversity, and and of course there are orchestras like Sinfonietta that have been doing it for decades. Um, if you were to look at that and say, that obviously, there's some different structures for Sinfonietta versus, you know, um, you know, certain major city orchestras or even in your own neck of the woods, Chicago Symphony. What would you say, though, given this work in history that Sinfonietta has had, what would you say might be the top one or two things that um, other orchestras could learn from Sinfonietta, might look to Sinfonietta to say, we should see how we could emulate that or replicate that or in some way internalize what we've seen them do successfully that we should do. Is there any kind of things that stand out? Absolutely. I sit um, on a committee for Group One Orchestras for League of American Orchestras for the EDI kind of management committee. And I think my biggest you know, hope is to share the kind of behind the scenes and honestly just raw kind of um, data and experiences that comes with this work. I think when people see Chicago Sinfonietta, they say, oh, it's made, they make it so easy and it's so easy because they've been doing it for so long. And so I really tried to share kind of our internal practices, our hiring practices, our review practices, our outside consultation. I mean, we do a lot of just dirty work to make sure that we're progressing and staying true to our principles. And I think kind of sharing those pitfalls and the wins and that, you know, how it often is two steps um, forward, one back has been kind of the most important thing for me um, because it is um, not, you know, a straight line in terms of how things progress. It's usually, um, again, kind of going back to that North Star, it's usually wandering a little bit and kind of taking what you can <laughs> in the moment. So, and given this, and I want to kind of then pivot a little to pandemic stuff and, and mm -hmm. dealing with that as a, as a CEO, but with the kind of racial equity work, given the events from this past year, the re almost defining, certainly a refocusing on it for so many institutions, which seems to be a good thing. But for Sinfonietta, have you found that these events from this past year have helped your work with racial equity or hampered it or and how do you see things moving forward societally related related to these racial equity issues absolutely i think it is a lot of attention of course has been put on the organization um you know we're in the media quite a bit because people do look at us as a leader in terms of orchestras and so I'm very mindful that any practices that we do in the community or any practices that we do from a programming standpoint or just overall governance um, has uh, repercussions and consequences because it has been the model or standard for our, our field in general. Um, so I think, you know, the recent kind of resurgence of social justice has really um, challenged me to really articulate what we're doing um, in a way that uh, when we veer off, um, we can quickly kind of pivot on, again, kind of going back to our original principles, because it is, I think, important for everyone to have that elevator pitch and really being able to describe, you know, what is it that we do and why do, why do we do it? Um, and so we are really mindful about word choice, for instance, um, really going through word clouds and really describing, okay, how would you identify the, the institution and why this word and not this one? And, you know, what's the, the, the thread or the storyline behind why we have concepts around this, you know, particular group of words. So really being really mindful and open. Again, it's, I, I'm a really big, you know, everyone thinks that everyone kind of works for me and this, you know, the CEO is at the top and the employees kind of funnel up, but I really try to kind of put that upside down and I'm really kind of supporting staff and, um, and our groups. And so I say, you know, everyone has stakeholdership into this institution. So kind of, taking all of these ideas and thoughts of what Chicago Sinfonietta is, which that is for sure our strength, 
the just the overall kind of commitment to the mission. Um, so yeah, taking that and then making it um, unified is uh, challenging, but also probably the most rewarding part because you know I get to hear from so many different individuals. Awesome, awesome. So of course we have this you know uh, pandemic uh, going around. Uh, and that has, of course, redefined our organizations, our own individual lives for the past year. Um, I, I know you've been, you know, certainly very successful in terms of addressing it. And I think a lot of our viewers now are looking towards the end, right? They're looking towards more vaccines and all of that and moving forward. As we begin to come out, what's your sense? Are, are you, do you have specific plans in place now for how Sinfonietta will kind of come forth from the pandemic, anything you could share that especially our audience would benefit from not only learning about Sinfonietta, but potentially that they might think, oh, here's something I can be thinking about for my own organization. Absolutely. So again, to relate it back to just what I, I'm used to being a musician, if you injure your left hand, you focus on mental practicing and right hand technique and you, you know, you might learn a language to understand the phonetics of why I compose, you know, there's all these other things that you wish you had time to do, um, but you don't because you're doing kind of the basic business as usual. And so the pandemic, of course, took away some fundamental kind of interactions um, that we are used to in person and changed operations greatly. And so I have really focused on what can we do now that two years, three years out, we'll say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we took advantage of that time to not just kind of keep operations, you know, up and running, but really kind of invest into this idea that the world will never be the same. And there's things we can do now that set us up um, to expand. And so here it's been a huge investment in our tech infrastructure. Um, so a lot of new systems, uh, and, you know, a lot of internal things. So it's not things that people would see, but I think over the next two and three years, they're gonna be like, why are they able to do this? Or why are they able to do this project? And it's because we spent so much time really kind of investing um, and again, really messy work, but you know, taking apart these systems that have just been in place because they work and really finding ways to you know, train staff, for instance, in uh, new technology and getting new vendors and going through all of our old kind of relationships with, in terms of like vendor contracts and finding what actually allows us you know, to grow in the most um, you know, manageable way. And so that has been by far probably 70% of our, our energy so far. Cool, awesome, awesome. Well, unfortunately we are just about out of time, but I was curious, you know, obviously you're coming in as a CEO, just finishing up your first year, congratulations again. Uh, in that role, um, but between, you know, the challenges that just naturally would be there taking on any type of leadership role like this, plus the pandemic, plus racial equity, plus, you know, just personal life um, uh, events and, and challenges that arise, I'm curious, where do you find your inspiration on those tougher days? Where, where do you find or tap into a source of strength? Absolutely. I think going back to kind of why why you're here and why you want the job um, and why you're still invested into the work. I joke a lot and I never wanted to be a CEO. And it's because when I, you know, I admire so many of my mentors, but I just thought, mm, like, that's not really what like speaks to me. And so for me, I really focus on, you know, there are the arts in general is about access. That's what made me fall in love with it. Um, like, yes, I love music. Yes, I love art. But the the access that it gives you to others, um, not just kind of in your immediate community, but just the world at large um, has always kind of inspired me to share that with others. And so I really kind of reflect on um, anecdotal experiences and, you know, those small stories um, to remind me, uh, you know, to kind of push or to the next milestone. And that definitely pushes me quite a bit because you know you have ups and downs every single day. <laughs> wow. Blake, Anthony, Johnson, you truly are one of the arts engines who are powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Aaron. <laughs>